Welcome to Tech London, a show featuring interviews with London's top creative entrepreneurs, startups, investors, design agencies, internet marketers, and freelancers that make up the Tech London online community, which mostly lives on the Slack instant messaging platform. We rotate through both hosts and guests for these interviews, so you have the chance to hear from multiple perspectives on London's tech scene. Hello, folks. Welcome back to another Tech London podcast. And in the Tech London <laughs> studio today, I have Jim. And Jim, what are you known for? And what would you like to be known for? Hi, thanks, Bernie. Um, I guess I, I work with a, a team of LGBT people. Um, and we're, we're pretty diverse. So somebody identifies as lesbian, somebody is, I'm, I'm the gay man of the group. We have a bisexual person and a, and a trans person, but we all come from a, a management background and CIPD, Chartered Institute of Personal Development. So we're all very tooled up about policies and procedures. And what we're trying to do is make a difference in the workplace, um, to help organizations be much more LGBT inclusive, both for their own staff, because we know and there's evidence that that is still an issue, but also for working with customers um, and that's essentially what, what we're about and we met at the legendary Impact Brixton where, you, where you, there was a pitch night there folks and we'll put a link in the show notes to the last Friday which is on the last Friday which is the best I'll tell you what mm. that is the best event I've ever been to in a co-working space and um, so at, at that event Jim you, you, you were pitching the uh, Pride UK quality standard. So let's go. Th- let's kind of go through that that presentation. And one of the, one of the things we, we were, just to pretend you know we were talking about this before we came on air. Mm. Like being an employee in in one way, um, kind of awareness and respect for diversity in the lgbtq community and understanding and everything and i don't know whether it's just because we live in london and it's a in an amazing city but it's never been more um prominent but at the same time it's never been tougher to be i don't know it's never been tougher to be an employee is the right thing to say but being an employee in the uk right now is a is a shitstorm and mm. i i could you guide me like i i feel that unscrupulous employers will use any type of harassment or motive to uh, make it uncomfortable for people. And I, is it accurate to say that people in the LGTBQ community are a bit more prone to that end of the stick? Yeah, definitely. And um, not necessarily pointing the figure at senior management at, at every level within organizations. And many of the issues that arise are from colleagues of LGBT people. Um, I mean, just to give you a direct example from research that we did recently, this is our own research with, with an organization. The organization had um, 136 staff and um, they all responded as part of our quality standard we, we have a confidential staff survey it's completely confidential so names aren't uh, linked and we write a, a separate report that goes to senior management so they, they can't actually trace who said or or, or, or has referenced what but in this particular report I've got in front of me which is relatively recent a couple of months ago um, one paragraph if I read it and um, this organization this is now this is happening now this is not like 30 years ago um, in the the confidential survey, 15 staff said that they'd heard people make very hostile remarks about lesbian, gay, bisexual or trans people at their work. The three people, now that's not huge, three, but still three people had real concerns that a person might be getting poor um, attention as a customer because they identified as LGBT. Um, and six people said they weren't clear about what they should do if they witnessed something or heard something um, around LGBT discrimination, bullying or harassment. Um, they did interestingly think in this organization that their senior management would be supportive if anyone raised issues and generally were positive around inclusion generally, you know, the whole equality, diversity, inclusion agenda. Um, but it's interesting that they didn't seem to know what to do if they did witness something in their workplace. So that's, that's a real situation that's quite recently. Um, and there are big concern around that one, and also it was picked up with two or three other confidential surveys we did, is people saying that they'd witnessed something that was concerning uh, in their workplace, but they were claiming that they didn't know what to do. Now, we would think that the normal kinds of reporting 
would apply. You know, the, your, your normal safeguarding or whatever is your, your policy to raise complaints about harassment and, and bullying. But in this case, perhaps because people were just a little bit lacking in awareness, they possibly felt that there was some specialised procedure around LGBT um, bullying and harassment, when of course there isn't. Um, I mean, our, our experience working with organisations on, on, on this as a workplace issue is that there is definitely um, some homophobia biphobia and transphobia still taking place and we've got evidence of that but a lot of it is a lack of confidence and people being worried about saying or doing the wrong thing and therefore not really tackling things that, 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 I, I think that's very accurate I personally even you know some even now i i wonder what to say sometimes and then in i mean if, if something horrible was going down i'd just get involved and hope for the best but um the uh i, I feel because of so much so much experience i've had i now feel equipped to do that but i i wouldn't be able to do that even like four years ago even though i would have wanted to and i would just would have been you know panicked and and hope something happened but yeah. I, I feel that i feel that's where i feel that's where people are um and just on that so what what we find is when we get talking to people when they feel safe and they feel comfortable talking to us about about what they think about about these kinds of issues um um they they often generally feel that the right thing to do is just to, to walk on by or just to be silent they they hold back you know and the sadness there is a lot of these people really could reach out and, and do something but but they're, they're holding back because they they think um you know in the old cliche you know political correctness will will hold them up in in some way but it's interesting the other way around as well that um the national this is um the biggest survey that i'm aware of that's been done in the uk was done in 2018 by government by the equalities um office of of, of the government at the time they surveyed a hundred thousand so this is huge it was just over a hundred thousand um people who define themselves in some way LGBT in the UK um, and they asked about a whole lot of stuff but part of that and I think the survey is still out there on, on Government Equality's website I think you can still download at least a, a summary of it one section is about the workplace specifically um, and a, an astonishing fact to me that came out of that and this is 2018 so okay five years ago but it's not 50 years ago half the people who identified in some way LGBT said that they didn't they weren't out they didn't tell people that at work because they just weren't sufficiently confident that the organizational culture would protect them if there were any problems. Now that's astonishing to me because I, I, I do again think that most that we, you mentioned earlier, most organizations have moved on. Most organizations are far more aware than they used to be. I think we do have I think the UK in many areas leads the world around LGBT legislation uh, with one qualification that's only happened since about the year 2000. I grew up as I'm an older gay man when I grew up um, it was still illegal for me to have same-sex relationships until I was 21 years old and we've we've changed that and we've changed a lot of things I would I, I had a civil partnership a few years ago couldn't have done that at the time and of course you can you can marry that now but there are still half the people in the workplace who say they still don't feel confident and comfortable so the issue for that for me is that senior management are not sending out the right signals or not sending out signals at all that they are LGBT inclusive one of the things that we do with a quality standard is in fact we actually require that whoever is the senior management team of any organization and sometimes this might be quite a big organization that our, our team of, of people involved in the quality standard get to meet with that senior management team at the beginning of the process and at the end of the process. We want to ensure that management are absolutely behind going through what effectively is an, an organizational change and development process around LGBT inclusion because if the senior management are not on board then there'll be all sorts of reasons why this won't be a, an organizational process and some people will be able to say you know it, 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 it's not my bag it doesn't belong to me. We were um, cause I was podcasting with Danae and I'll link to that episode in the show notes here uh, around this kind of area. And what what is the, I mean, I, don't, I mean, this in a, the context of what we're talking about here is like, why is having a quality standard? What's in it for the company to have a quality standard? Because it's like we, you know, like it's it is obviously very important. But what's in it for the faceless corporation that has to get and keep a customer? What what's the advantage of them taking part in this process? I think it's um, 
I, w- I would say it's a one-stop shop to have a complete health check audit around your organization and LGBT issues um, in every aspect. It can be done if it's very well planned. It can be done. The whole process can take place within about three months or so. On average, it can. I'd say in our experience, it's longer, but that tends to be because the, the program has not been planned sufficiently well by the organization itself. It enables the organization to get direct access to specialized HR advice and this, we're, we're CIPD professionals ourselves. We come from this background. We understand the minute detail of policies and procedures and, and, and that side of things. But from a team of people who themselves um, are LGBT and we have our own experience of working with organizations as lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans people ourselves. So it, it brings all that together. Um, and just if, if I can just go on a, a little bit, and I don't want to, to yeah, bore, sure. our, bore our audience, but, but just picking up your, your question now, what's involved? So um, we review all the communications of an organization. So we will look at um, if you've got a, a, a common kind of, I don't know, brochure or if you use social media in a certain way, or particularly the website. We'll look around the website. One of the, one of the things I often say to organizations is, particularly those who have got very big websites, um, quite expensive websites, is I'll be curious if our LGBT team go around your website and find a single thing which suggests LGBT people are welcome to your organization. And the number of organizations have been around and, and there has been absolutely nothing at all. Um, and there are just many little things that could be done within a web sh- website um, that send out those those kinds of signals. So we, we look at the communications and our communications director is somebody who's worked in LGBT media and press all her life. Um, she was deputy editor of something called Diva magazine. Some people may be aware of that magazine. Um, and she does a real critique of an organization's comms in terms of sending out the right messages, both internally and externally. And she'll write a report on that. And that goes to the, the senior management. Um, one of my previous roles was I've worked in two roles as quite senior policy person. I review an organization's policies, so not every single one, obviously, but we asked to see around about a dozen policies which we think are relevant. So, for example, I'd be interested in looking at an organization's safeguarding policy, for example. Um, and I will write a report when I've done that work as to whether there are gaps in policy um, or there are policies which could be improved. And sometimes it's just a tone of voice. Sometimes an organization, for example, has a, an EDI, um, uh, Equality, Diversity, Inclusion Statement, but it sounds overly, um, what can I say, legalistic, prescriptive, doesn't sound welcoming yeah. and warm in complex, tone of voice. Yeah. Complex it, it, and heavy. Yeah, and, and, and gives the impression of saying, well, we're doing this because we have to because it's a law and we've got to say this, rather than using the right kind of language that, that makes somebody who is LGBT and, and who spots that um, realize this organization is is, is an open, inclusive organization. And just something on policies, for example, I've reviewed probably over the last few years, maybe about 30 organizations' policies in, in the detail. And something that comes up time and time again is organizations not having any kind of policy around trans and transitioning, transitioning at work, for example. Um, what that means is if somebody does make a decision to transition, um, and this is becoming more common later in life than it used to be, um, the organization doesn't have a position and approach to actually tackling that. So that then becomes a, almost like a, a problem to be solved by the organization when there should be absolutely clear um, procedures about this is what we do in this situation. This is how this is handled. So we look at all the comms. We look at all the policies. We write a report. I write a report on the, the, the policies. And we also, going back to that earlier point, we have a survey, a confidential survey of all staff. Very short, only 10 questions. So it shouldn't take staff more than about 10, 15 minutes to complete. But um, one of our team, our research person, will bring that together in a, in a report and feedback a little bit like I did before about um, the staff who said that they'd witnessed things which were concerning, but they didn't know how to raise complaints uh, around it. So we would pick up issues like that and take them back to management. And then we meet with management and we'll go through all those things that we found out and think practically about what can be done to try to fill some of the gaps and try to strengthen the inclusiveness of the, the organization. The extra thing that we do right at the end of the process is we have a team, about 12 LGBT people who act as mystery shoppers. So depending on what the organization is, they might send a few emails, they might make a few calls, they might actually rock up at the door and, and talk to somebody on reception, um, but there'll be some element about 
disclosure that they are LGBT in that situation, and they will see how that is handled. Um, I'll give you one example that that came up, which doesn't relate to that, actually. This is, actually, this is a personal story. When I was a lot younger, um, I joined a, a very big national charity. I won't name it, but it was huge. It wasn't a small charity. And this charity, once a year, would take their staff away, and they would have a staff conference. And because they, they had money, they were a large charity, they were uh, they would invite the I think it, I think the line on the in, in, of the um, invite was you can bring your wife. Your wife could come along. So there's an assumption. On the whole, this is pre same sex uh, relationships and marriage. Um, this would be a view. I think that um, that it would be a woman who is the wife, and the, the male would be the, um, the the worker in that relationship. That's, that's that, like that um, that thing about uh, a there's an accident and a son and a husband, a son and a man go into hospital. And the doctor says, that's my husband. And it's like, oh. And, and then there's, like, everyone assumes the doctor is a man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these are just picking that example. Uh, but in our training, we also provide training for organizations to do the quality standard. Um, a lot of our training is just testing out some of these scenarios and helping people realize this is going to happen from time to time. How would you handle it? What's the kind of language you would use in these situations? And if you get it wrong, sometimes we're going to get things wrong. How do we apologize in a, in a, you know, a normal kind of way and be able to, to move on? Um, so the example I was going to go to was, uh, this is my personal experience, where um, I went along because I was in a, my relationship at the time, and I, I went along to the um, person organizing this, and I said, oh, by the way, I'm a gay man. Is it okay if I bring my gay partner for this conference that was taking place over the weekend? And the woman um, looked at me and paused and said, oh, well, I just better check that out. <laughs> and, you know, it worked out okay in the end. But that kind of reaction, I, I immediately thought, oh, okay, then they're not prepared for the fact that some people might be in the same sex relationship. So, and what will they do in that situation? So why, why do you think she asked it like that? Is it because, is it like a, the cost of bringing someone? Is it that she was, this might not, you know, we might not allow... We might not. I know. I'm not trying to find the right word, but I know, think it's, it, it, I, it might not be okay for like gay yeah. people to be along. <laughs> yeah, I think. I, I think. It, I think it was um, not having been trained, or there not being a clear enough culture in the organisation to say, of course, there shouldn't be a problem. You know, <laughs> that situation. But also thinking, well, I've not come across this before, and I don't know what the rules are, and I don't want to get it wrong. You know, she was polite in a customer service kind of way, but we would expect if an organisation has an inclusive LGBT culture, there should not be a question about that you know and, and people should all assume that there wouldn't be a there wouldn't be a problem but i'm using that just as one example so but flipping back to the training so we as what i'm suggesting the reason why i think it's valuable for an organization to go through this kind of process is you can bring a lot of quite high level consultancy and training work together in in one small project so reviewing the comms and getting a report reviewing um the policies and getting a report getting to know what your staff really think about lgbt issues by having a confidential survey and then we develop training as a result of all this that is tailored to the organization and a lot of it to be honest is quite basic awareness training sometimes we're asked to do something a bit more specialist but it's generally just helping people feel at the end of the process that um, they're more comfortable and confident a lot of this is about confidence working with difference of different kinds uh, and the confidence to do that and one of the extra factors with our training which i think helps is we don't go out as individual trainers we go out lgbt so we'll have four trainers one lesbian one gay man um one bisexual one a trans person and because people have to spend time with us over the course of it might be half a day it depends we also do webinars um they also get that extra dimension that they they actually can ask questions directly and we always say you can ask us anything um and get an answer from a person who who is the lgbt person themselves so as i've got like at least four questions um as people uh let's start with the website one is how can you put stuff on your website without looking like your pride washing and because we, we had this the, the similar thing you're suggesting um came up in a, a whole project we did with co-working spaces um but like, how can you signpost without overdoing it and looking like you're i don't know desperate um I guess just what you said, don't overdo it. <laughs> 
it doesn't need to be lots and lots and lots of stuff and sometimes that, that's quite inappropriate and it and is um overbalanced um in the wrong direction um just having well i think a, a simple bold statement about inclusion somewhere on the website which is not specific to lgbt but encompasses lgbt you know um a, a clear a diversity statement that you'd be, you'd be surprised how many organizations you go to the website, the home page and go through main pages and you don't find any kind of statement saying all are welcome here. However, that is done. Um, I do think it's not too corny to, to somewhere have, um, uh, rainbow colors. I know rainbow colors doesn't just designate LGBT, but I think it, it, it is still a high visibility reference. Um, and, Having a quality standard in itself, I mean, our quality standard is in rainbow colours. So having a, a quality standard amongst any other um, accreditation or quality marks that a, a website might have, but one that clearly is our symbol is um, a very bold um, quality mark tick um, with LGBT colours around it in, the, in the, the circle that you might be familiar with from trusted traders and other kinds of uh, organisations. Um, so yeah, I don't think it. Need, I don't. Uh, there doesn't need to be a lot of stuff, but there needs to. We would say there needs to be something. And if I mean certainly, if I was going to, I used to work. We used to uh, deliver a quality standard about LGBT in care. Um, and certainly when it gets to a certain age, I'm of that generation. Most older LGBT people um, don't have children. That was just, it was not a practical reality at the time. And most older LGBT people are estranged from their families. Um, the shame growing up in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, um, uh, and identifying, identifying LGBT was such that many parents did not want to know. So the result of that is when you get into the older generations, I'm thinking now starting with me in mid 60s, but going on to people in the 70s, 80s, I know gay, gay people in their 90s, and um, they tend to be relatively isolated. Um, they tend not to have that family support network. Um, and if they're in a relationship, if one person dies, they will then be contemplating going into care alone. Um, and our previous quality stand was trying to work with care homes to make sure that they were tooled up to be able to, to, to manage that. Um, because what happens is that people, a bit like the workplace I was mentioning earlier, people um, don't want to come out as, as LGBT uh, because they're frightened about what might happen to them. I think I've lost my way there. I don't know what the point no, that was. That, that, was right su- that was super interesting. Um, you know, I know, I know people like um, in, in that situation. Um, is I have a question there. Go on. You, you go first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll come back in. No, I've, I've I've lost my way again. I'm sorry. It's a senior moment. I'll let you pick up. Senior senior moment. So as so going back to the um, as someone is in a workplace transitioning, what my question there was like what what happened in the same way you just described as um, you know the shame and that used to be present in in society and being estranged from families. Like what what kind of happens? when someone transitions in the workplace because i i know people that have been through that process and they've been in a they've been in a um they've been in a very i know accepting not even not even accepting like supportive workplace and that's a that's a big thing for the the person going through and the people around it to go through so but what normally happens do people just leave their job transition and then go and get another job or like there's got to be some circumstance that is not as good as it could be to put it politely in in a in an ideal world in an ideal situation somebody would not need to leave their job um and 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 strike out a new somewhere else but rolling back from that in order for that to happen we'd look at the practicalities so again does the organisation have a clear policy around this? And it might be a separate policy um, developed by HR about how we handle transitioning uh, uh, when this occurs in the in the workplace. Um, it might be um, an, just a, a, a part of another um, wider equalities based uh, policy. Um, we would want to ensure there are issues dealt with about um, use of data and communication. So it's working very, very closely with the person themselves. So you would expect HR in a reasonable organization that's got some kind of an HR function. Um, having a conversation, this is, assume we, we, we know this is taking place and there is a conversation going on, but having a, a detailed conversation about what the person individually wants, 
what is good for them. Um, do they want do they want this to be communicated? And if they do, at what stage do they want to, it to be communicated? How do they want it to be communicated? So trying to give some power and agency to to the person themselves. But we won't go into huge detail. I think it starts with having a policy. And at the policy stage, HR will be thinking about all these different implications and then going into the comms side about how we handle that, both in terms of the actual written data, how we, how we uh, write things down about people, how we hold and store that information, but also about um, how we communicate this within the organization and who's going to do that. Is it the person themselves? Is it, um, I mean, and, and again, it will depend a little bit on the nature of the work, at the size of the organization and at the existing and culture of the organization but um, we I would hope that an organization that has that has considered this and has developed their policies and procedures and has developed their culture would not be an organization where somebody would feel the, the need to actually break and leave and start all over again on top of everything else that's happening in their lives so is, is there a line like when you say um, I hope this comes out right so when you say like oh there's a transitioning policy is that like a bring your device, to, bring your own device to work policy? Is that something that's comparable with that you could say to someone in an organisation? Oh, we need a transitioning policy, like you'd have yeah. the, you know, yeah. dog policy or something. Yeah, yeah. yes, there, there is. So what we will do as part of our, the quality standard, we don't. We don't write organizations' policies for them because we think organizations are different. They'll have their own way of expressing things, and, and, it, and also there's more ownership of the organization if they take responsibility for doing it. But if they're completely blank sheet of paper and, and, and are tearing their hair about, about how they develop a, a policy, in this case, a transitioning policy, and we would provide with usually three contrasting policies that tackle it from different organizations. So they might be organizations, different organizational cultures. They might be organizations of different size and complexity but they'll have something to go on. We will then review that policy when they've developed it and give our views about um, whether we think it's, it's ready to go or whether it needs more work. And in that case, um, the person who would be leading on that would be the trans member of our team who also comes from a management consultancy background. So she would be the, the kind of the, the key person advising HR on taking that forward. That is super interesting. I never thought I'd get say that's super interesting talking about policies, but um, it's there. So, um, Jim, where can we find you? We'll put links in all the show notes and stuff to this, but like, just say out loud for people who are like, you know, running or cooking. Um, yeah. Where can people find you online? And, you know, what's what, what, is, is, if there's a final thought you want to leave with? Definitely do that. Okay. But, um, best way in um, is to reach our website because it, it, it's all about the quality standard. Um, so it's reasonably memorable, I think. Pride, sorry, www.prideukqualitystandard.com. www.prideuk, all one word, quality standard. Dot com and in there um, it just it tells you the history of how we developed the, the, the standard today it tells you a little bit about the people involved in our our backgrounds um, but it, it also goes through all the different elements that are involved in the standard and something I didn't mention earlier is when somebody is awarded the standard and we would hope that they would be awarded the standard so far nobody has failed it we work very very hard to to help an organization if it's struggling on some of the areas when the standards awarded would it last for three years and during that time you can call on us as consultants for anything that you, that, you, that you need. There might be new new policies you want to develop in the future. The law might change about certain things. You might want to come back to us about some, some legal um, around HR issues. Um, and there's also a, a discount on any future training that people want. So there are other things that happen in, the, in that service package over the three years. Just briefly, I didn't mention it earlier. In terms of costs, apart from, um, generally speaking, I would say small to medium organization around about two to three thousand pounds so not hundreds of thousands of pounds um medium sized organization around about five or six thousand the largest organization we worked for we charged about eleven thousand pounds um uh, and the costing is very particular to the, the size of the organization so it's the numbers of the staff so imagine writing a, a, a report on um, a staff survey of 30 is going to be different from a staff survey of three and a half thousand people for example it's going to take longer um, number of staff and number of sites of an organization and different service functions just so that's there's a rationale for our for our costings um, and um, to leave with a final thought, I think this is doable stuff. The organizations we work with to date, the key thing that's come up is people said it opened up a dialogue. 
they had been perhaps focusing on some other issues, um, let's say race and ethnicity, for example, let's say um, gender, gender pay gaps and things like that, but LGBT had not actually popped up. Sometimes because people think there's nothing to do there, that's all sorted. Somebody actually said to me a few months ago, you, you've got it all now, haven't you? <laughs> so I thought it was quite funny. I think what he meant was, oh, well, you know, LGBT people, you know, everything's sorted and fixed, but it's not, you know. It's government not, ser- no. The government oh, survey dear. itself would say half the people in workplace still don't don't feel comfortable coming out. So that would be my final thought. That is, it's changeable, it's doable, we can get a dialogue going. And a lot of this, again, is not actually homophobia, biphobia, transphobia. It's a lack of confidence and a lack of understanding. Yeah, the, the, it, it is like part of you think it, it's easy to think how it is, but um, there's so many stories where people are accidentally say something that is very ill thought out and there's this you know people i know that work in places where they should know better um and they they take actions and do things that are i think not often met met with ill intent but they make they they don't they accident this is it they accidentally dehumanize people and don't and make them put them in a position where they don't feel safe and having people feel safe and confident and at home is is really really important and it's those little things those really small what some people might, might consider to be microaggressions even though they're not meant to hurt um that stop people coming out that's that, that make people feel actually I'm, i just don't feel 100 percent about this organization because of what that person said or did <laughs> thank you very much for your time today jim i'm Delighted we did this, and um, I'm just going to finish by saying um, that you're based in Brixton. So if anyone wandering around Cold Harbour Lane and wants to find out more, um, go to Jim's website. And ladies and gentlemen, we if you go to techlondon.io, you can join the Slack channel there. There are thousands of people who are creators, startup founders, freelancers, eight micro agencies of all um, – shapes and sizes and the, one of the best places to meet in person is every day from 10 till 12 in a different london co-working space there is what we call the right club so you can go there just take whatever you need to write whether it's a, a, a policy or um, a sales email or a poem and people gather there we've been doing this in co-working spaces since 2016 um, and it's a great place to meet other people make connections and build community thank you very much for your time today thanks very much everyone bye bye You've been listening to The Tech London Show. If you're interested in joining the community or even making an appearance on this show, make sure you join our Slack group over at techlondon.io. Till next time.